I like to start with this XKCD comic that you may or may not have seen before uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, this talk is hopefully going to be funny. Um, second of all, uh, none of the concepts I'm going to discuss today are actually that new. So Lisp has been around since like the 60s, 70s, someone might know better than me, and that's where a lot of these concepts were introduced. Uh, we're going to be talking about functional programming fundamentals today. Um, so who am I? I am Matthew Gersman, that's my name. I work for Dropbox. We make a thing where you can share files. We are primarily hiring engineering managers, so if you know how to manage people, talk to me. And you can follow me on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter, it validates me. I feel good about myself when you do that. <laughs> and if you want to see a link to these slides, bit.ly slash fp hyphen fundamentals, please follow me on Twitter. <laughs> What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about functional programming, and we're going to talk about declarative versus imperative styles. And the reason we're going to talk about these things is because there's a lot of concepts that we covered actually tonight that were commonly referred to as buzzwords or patterns. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to functional programming com uh, concepts that we now take for granted that are very much just basic concepts. So we're going to cover those tonight. So if you missed a lot of the buzzwords earlier, you might catch up right now. So the other thing we're going to talk about is declarative versus imperative styles. So when you're done, hopefully those will be words you actually understand. What are we not going to talk about today? We are not going to talk about monads. We are not going to talk about lambda calculus. We are not going to talk about functors. And I'm going to avoid as much scary jargon as possible. So if you want to know what these mean, go look at my slides, click the reference to number two, and you can learn about monads. I don't know what they are. <laughs> so FP actually tends to get a bad rep historically because functional programming combines the flexibility and power of abstract mathematics with the intuitive clarity of abstract mathematics. And if you look at the Wikipedia page for lambda calculus, you can see why. I don't know what this means, do you? Because like. So if you want to explain this, please do. It's a waste of time. I've never used this on the job, ever. So we're going to skip that. And we're going, yeah, Taylor says this is absurd. Thank you, Taylor. I agree. We can, we can take a step back now. So I believe in two things. Number one, you should be using the best tool for the job, use the best pattern for the job, use the thing that makes sense. And number two, much like this little ice cream emoji that you can't see in the back, moderation is key with everything. <coughs> so we're going to shake it off. We're going to move on. I promise Taylor Swift in this talk. So what's the point? We want to make our code more readable. We want to make our code easier to reason about. We want to make our code easier to test. And we want to make our users happier. In fact, the thing we're optimizing for here is happiness, both developer happiness and user happiness. Like That's what we're optimizing for. So when is functional programming most useful? So functional programming is exceptionally useful when we're doing one-to-one -one data transformations, and I'll show you what that means in a second. So if we have an app that uses React and Redux, we'll commonly put a functional selector layer in the middle. In my talk, I'm going to use Lodash as an example because that's what we use at Dropbox, but you're welcome to use Ramda or Immutable or any other library that makes you happy. So long as it's not MooTools, it's cool. I'm glad someone got that joke. So, Commonly, we'll store in our data store in like Redux. We'll want to store things by ID, for example, like a list of users, and we'll store them by ID so we can get near constant lookup time. And then in our component, we often just want to like spit out avatars or like spit out an array of something. And we just want to receive as props the array of users. So that is what this functional selector layer does in the middle, is it converts the user map to array. So it is a function that takes a user map and then converts it to a list of users. So <clears throat> what exactly is functional programming? We're going to take even more steps back. So functional programming, often abbreviated FP, I'm now allowed to say FP in this talk, is the process of building software by composing pure functions. Well, what's a pure function? A pure function is a function which, given the same inputs, always returns the same output and has no side effects. So 2 plus 2 is always 4. 3 times 3 is always 9. This doesn't have any side effects. And we actually talked about uh, one of the talks earlier discussed side effects, and now we're going to cover what some of those are. And the thing is, is sometimes side effects are necessary, right? Like, you have to hit your server to get data, you have to do stuff, but it just means that they're not a pure function, which is why I'm not saying, like, hey, this is all bad stuff. I'm just saying, like, you need to know these are side effects, and be mindful of that when you're writing code and when you're writing something called a pure function. So the first example is mutation. So in this case, I have an array, and I am popping the first element off of it. And now we've modified the array. 
So if I call pop with the same array multiple times, it's going to return a different result every time because it's operating on the same reference to the same array. And because of that, other things that are dealing with that array won't be able to determine like what's changing from under it. Another example is shared states. So we have this increment and decrement function. And these could be called in any order, and we don't know what they're going to return. And like someone could set i equal to foo, and maybe that works in JavaScript. I'm actually not sure what string plus plus does. Someone else might know. But <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, like, it's problematic. And then finally, async code, right? Like we have to hit servers, but it's not good for a data transformation. Like this set time out here, what if the event loop is full? Like what if a million things are going on? We don't actually know when this is going to get incremented. So Taylor says, I would very much like to be excluded from this narrative, and I agree with her. So this is the last Taylor Swift GIF for a while. <laughs> we'll come back to Taylor later. <laughs> so let's look at an example. So the first function here is called clone, and it takes an object, and it splats the object and copies it over. The second function is called kill parents, and it takes a wizard. You can see where this is going. So we mark the wizard's parents as dead, and we return the wizard. We've mutated the wizard now, which, anyway. And then we're going to give the wizard a scar. Yes, yes, it's Harry Potter. <laughs> so we mark wizard.scar equals true, and that function's over. And we're going to call these in order. So we have name is Harry Potter, then we clone him, then we kill his parents, then we add a scar, which is the order those things happen in the book. <laughs> so what you would expect this code to do is Harry Potter, Harry Potter, Harry Potter with dead parents, Harry Potter with dead parents, and a scar. Is that what's going to happen? No, it's not. <laughs> so it's actually going to be Harry Potter, Harry Potter with a scar and dead parents, and then undefined, because fun fact, I threw a bug in there for you. So these are operating on the exact same reference to the same object. And then this one is two, but I didn't actually return anything in this function. So that one is undefined. So this code is just much less predictable because we're mutating the stuff that's passed to it. It's much better to return a brand new thing than mutate the, thi than mutate the thing that was given to it. So the next topic we're going to talk about is declarative and imperative programming styles. And I'm going to be honest, I could not find a GIF that represented this in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> so I present you with Zoidberg. Enjoy. That's, that turkey looks delicious. I don't know if it was in the microwave. If anyone knows what episode this is from, please let me know after the talk. <laughs> cool. Declarative code, buzzword, describes what it does. Imperative code describes how it does it. So we've all kind of standardized, we're at a React meetup, that the best way to do things is just to have a component that says, this is the state of the world as it, is, as, as it exists today. We have a counter. It's at a certain number. We're going to return a span with that counter. Imperative code, the way we used to do this with jQuery or any other library, was we would get the DOM element, we would like find it, and then we would put the inner HTML, and we'd call this a whole bunch of times, and we would manually manage this. And something I want to point out before we dive into examples, this doesn't just magically work. Declarative code is always going to be processed by something imperative eventually. So React has an underlying imperative library that is very well abstracted and doesn't leak bugs into our code, theoretically. Lodash applies the same way. And even if you look at languages like Lisp or Haskell, which are theoretically declarative and purely functional, they eventually compile down to machine code, which runs on our processor, and that is imperative. So let's look at some simple examples. So this one is get file map by ID, and we have an object, and we want to just key uh, we take an array of files and we want to key the files by ID so we can easily look them up. You've probably done this in some practice programming interview question for no reason. And it's like six lines of code, I think. And it's fine, it works. But did you actually know that if you start your incrementer clause, your, uh, your index at negative one and then combine your increment and exit clause, it's actually slightly faster. It's the stupidest of micro optimizations, but Lodash does it all over the place. And it makes sense because that's a library and they can do it there. But please don't do that in your code. And then it's like there's room for bugs here, right? What if a file doesn't have an ID? What if something just like weird happens? Like there's so many things that can go wrong here when this is a one liner with any functional library. So lodash.keyby loops over the files, gets the IDs, spits out an object with IDs that are mapped to files. Another great example that's very simple is we have a list of files. We have a name on each file. We want to pluck the name off of each file and put it in a new array. This is just a map. So mapping says, 
loop over this array and then do some kind of transform on every single object inside of it. Uh, Lodash has a shorthand that just says, hey, if you give me a string, give me the property that's there. People are pointing. Cool. Anyway. Cool. So, um, <laughs> oh no, I ruined the punchline. So, anyway, I think we've covered a lot of technical stuff today, and I know you're all a little brain dead. So, I decided to add 15 to 30 seconds of my talk purely for my own amusement. So, I'm going to talk about Taylor Swift's album Red. This is her pivotal album. This is when she transformed herself from a teen country star to the modern Madonna she is today. I mean, look at this track list. Like, I could name all of my favorite songs off this album, but it would take me to, like, I would just end up naming all the album minus, like, two songs. If you have not listened to this album, do yourself a favor and just listen to it. It's fantastic. Taylor Swift is great. And that's the rest of the Taylor Swift for this talk. We're now only Harry Potter. <laughs> cool. Functional concepts, Harry gets his wand. This is going to be all exciting. So the first one, well, I'm going to do these in pairs. First one is separation. If you try to perform effects in logic at the same time, you may create hidden side effects, which cause bugs in the logic. You want to keep functions small. You want to do one thing at a time and do it well. And don't worry, there'll be examples that make this make more sense. The second one is composition. You want to plan for composition. You want to write functions whose outputs will naturally work as inputs to many other functions, and you want to keep function signatures as simple as possible. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, let's look at some kind of Dropboxy files because we do every our examples because we do everything with files and PDFs are a big deal there. So in this case, we want to sort files by name. Well, <clears throat> that can just be a simple function that takes one parameter and then calls out to Lodash file Lodash sort by with files and name. Same thing for get PDF files. This is a filter. So in functional programming, filter is filter in. So it's like only do things where this is truthy. So we only include the files that have the extension PDF. And then this last one is a map, which I showed you earlier, which just gets the name off of all of them. And because these functions are so small and have very predictable input outputs, they combine together really nicely. So Lodash has a cool utility called Flow that's very similar to a bash pipe or the pipe that we are hopefully getting in JavaScript, but will probably just sit in TC39 land forever. Um, and what, the way this works is <coughs> it takes a list of functions and then it calls those functions in order. So it will call get P it will create a new function called get sorted PDF file names, and then it will call the first function with the parameters you pass to it and then call this guy's output to this one. And then we actually don't even need our other function because now it's just an array of strings, so we can call that with sort by. And I wanted to illustrate exactly what's going on here. So if you look at this code, which is functionally equivalent, we're calling get PDF files on the list of files, then we're calling get file names on the PDF files, and then we're sorting that list of strings. So that's all that's happening here. It's just a different style of writing code. Now, it's up to you to decide which one of these is better for your team. Flow will have some micro optimizations inside of it. So like if you flow multiple things together, Lodash is going to take care of that for you and make sure your call stack doesn't get crazy. But if this code is more readable to your team and you're going to have fewer people asking you questions, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Use your best judgment. Cool. Next two concepts are immutability and memoization. So immutability is a really big one, which is that the true constant is change. Mutation hides change. Hidden change manifests chaos. Therefore, the wise embrace history. I got this from an article called The Tao of Immutability, and it's actually really good, and it's a hilarious title. Um, the second one is memoization, which is memoization is a caching technique, which basically just says, hey, if we've gotten these arguments before and we know it's going to be the same output, we can just return the same thing that we returned last time. And that composes really nicely with pure functions, because if you know the input and output are always going to be the same, you can just cache it, and you don't have to do an expensive operation. So let's look at. An example. So I have, we're about to get a little darker, I have kill sibling as a function, which takes a wizard. And it uh, ignored the, the, the glaring bugs in this code. It needed to be simple for a demo. So I copy over the whole wizard, and then I decrement the wizard's number of siblings by one. So I'm going to memoize this function here. So now I've produced a new function called kill sibling memoize. And I'm going to pass it Ron Weasley. And Ron Weasley, at the beginning of the books, has five brothers and one sister. And in the seventh book, spoiler, I'm sorry. I guess I should have had like a spoiler warning before this talk. Um, Fred dies, one of his brothers. So we call kill sibling memoized on Ron, and it's Ron after Fred dies. And if we do the comparison check, because we change these, 
we immediately know that something has changed just because the object has changed. And I mean, of course it's changed. His brother died. He's a different person now. But anyway, so, and if we call kill sibling memoized multiple times with Ron, it has cached on the reference to the original object, and it's going to return the same object every time. So if I do this, run after Fred dies again, and I uh, do an equals check, it's going to return true. Now the one thing I want to point out is if I call that original function again, it is going to return a new object because it's not memoized. So you want to make sure that when you're copying over objects, you're doing this thoughtfully, because right here, these two uh, run after Fred dies objects are the exact same thing, but JavaScript thinks they're different because they're different references. And this is actually how Redux works under the hood and reselect works under the hood, in that it relies on just knowing that a reference has changed. Because if we know that any reference has changed, then we can just re-render everything below it and not have to like recurse our tree and figure out which thing has changed. So mutability is really powerful there and pairs nicely with the rest of the concepts I've showed you. So one more for my own amusement. <laughs> I know it's been a long, long meetup. So I'm going to talk about Ron Weasley for a second. Ron Weasley is the single most underrated characters in the character in the movies, or just in the series. So the movies butchered him. They took every one of his good lines and they gave it to Hermione. It is a crime what they did to Ronald Weasley. Read the books again and compare it to the films. I promise you he is a completely different character in those two environments. If you want to ask me afterwards, I have like a 10 minute rant on it, but you didn't sign up to see that. <laughs> Higher order functions, we're back to Hermione. She's also great. Cool, so higher order components. We talked about those earlier, thank you. Um, these are where those come from. So in math and computer science, a higher order function is a function that either takes a function as one of its arguments or returns a function as its result. And you've probably done this a lot without knowing the name. So the first example is a callback, <coughs> which in this case we have fetch, which is hitting an API, and we have the then function, which takes a callback. And that's, that's a higher order function then, because it takes a callback as its, uh, as its property, as its argument. Another example is a function that returns a function, which is a closure, which you might have done before. So in this case, I have a counter generator, which is just going to log i++, or plus plus i, and it's going to return a function that's bound to this i, and it's going to increment every time I call it. What's kind of interesting here is counter generator is a pure function, whereas counter is not, because counter generator always returns a new function, whereas counter is always doing something different. So the last one is a function that takes a function and returns a function. And I've done tons of these in this talk, so I don't even have to come up with a new one. So kill sibling, when we memoized it, memoize is a function that takes a function and returns a memoized function. In this case, flow is a function that takes multiple functions and returns one super duper function. I added one more just so I could say I filled in some sample code here. Debounce is another great example. So debounce is commonly used so that you can keep calling a function and it won't fire until it's stopped being called. So a lot of the time it's done for like scroll handlers. So that way like whatever function it is won't get called until you've stopped scrolling. So in this case I have cast spell, which is expelling armis, and I call it three times and it only gets called once because I debounced it at 100 milliseconds. Cool. So last topic, and we've got the excellent Ron Weasley here to lead us into it. <coughs> currying and partial application. So currying is the technique of translating the evaluation of a function that takes multiple arguments, or a tuple of arguments, into evaluating a sequence of functions, each with a single argument. This is one of those definitions that just does not go over well, but the example is simple. So, I have this function called sum, which takes a, b, and c, and returns the sum of a, b, and c. That should be relatively straightforward. And I pass it to lodash.curry. So now this new curried sum function that I have, it can either take 1, 2, and 3 or return, and return 6. It can take 2 and 3 and return, five, and return a function that adds 5. I can call it that way. Or it can take one parameter and then take a new function that's either expecting one or two parameters. And it always works this way. And this is really great because this makes these functions more composable as you're going on. And this actually leads into our next subject, which is partial application. So partial application re refers to the process of fixing a number of arguments to a function, producing another function of smaller arity. So arity is the only piece of functional jargon I'm going to use tonight because I think it's important. And it just means the number of arguments a function takes. Just a four-letter word for that. It's not four letters, it's five. 
<laughs> anyway, so I have a new function, learn spell, no one's dying anymore, and we're copying over the wizard, and the wizard has a list of spells it knows, and we're gonna copy over the wizard's spells and then add a new spell. And I'm gonna partially apply Expelliarmus and Expecto Patronum to this function. So now I have a new function that is bound with this one parameter. And this is kind of cool because now I have these, I have this one very generalized function, and I have these two less general functions that were generated off of it. And you can see that when I call this with Harry Potter, I teach him Expelliarmus, which he learned in book two, and he learns that, and then I teach him Expecto Patronum, which he learned in book three, and they're in order, and it's a new reference every time, and we wrote minimal amounts of code, and everyone's happy, and no one's died yet. Cool. So throwback to 10 minutes ago, you've actually already seen this before. Remember all these like sort file things I generated before? These are all partial application. These are all taking a list of files and a lodash function and binding one parameter to that lodash function. And you could theoretically do it like this. Now this is the exact same argument I'm gonna tell you for flow, which is that the bottom one is fewer lines of code. It is technically ever so more performant but it's much less readable to the average developer. So if you're on a team of three and you guys all, or your team all knows how to do this stuff, go for it. If you're on a team of 50, maybe you don't wanna bother teaching this to everyone. So I wanna take a step back for that reason and remind you that we are optimizing for happiness. That is the point here. So we're not playing code golf. We're not trying to reduce the number of lines of code. We're not trying to make things turf, terse. We're not trying to sound smart. We're not trying to say the word monad as many times as we can. We're just optimizing for user and developer happiness. So some other resources I want to point out. Um, first of all, that it, once again is the link to these slides, bit.ly slash fp hyphen fundamentals. Um, the first book is called Functional Light JS. This is actually basically what I base this talk on. It is a much more in-depth version of writing functional JavaScript without any of the scary jargon. Hey underscore you're doing it wrong is about a five-year-old talk that was like one of the early signs of FP becoming popular in the JavaScript community and I just really like it. The last one is Unorthodox Performance by John David Dalton who is speaking at BuzzJS, we just found out. And that one is about all of the crazy stuff Lodash does under the hood to make its imperative functions super fast so you can write declarative code. So with that, does anyone have any questions? The question is that if your team use underscore, how do you convince people, like if you have a, a lot of people you know, use underscore, they are comfortable with it, how do you con con convert people to use Lodash? So I actually originally put this talk together because we migrated at Dropbox from underscore to Lodash. What was funny is up until two weeks ago, underscore hadn't seen a release for three years. So my simple argument was, hey, Lodash was forked off of underscore and it's got a million features and Lodash hasn't had a release and it's unmaintained. I don't, you don't need to rush to replace it. Like if you want to use this tooling, go for it. Um, we, uh, we did like, we, we did it through a series of code mods, which is just like automatic code replacement and a, replacement and a lot of work to get it done because we felt it was necessary. But if you're a startup and you have other th things to prioritize, like I'm not gonna tell you to switch functional libraries, like do what's best for you. Underscore has similar but different APIs. Is there any real difference between the querying that's built into um, with like EX6 and arrow functions and like the querying that comes with Lodash? Well, so using ES6 and arrow functions, is you're gonna be manually binding things in general. So it's just like a different style. It's not technically currying, because currying makes the function just able to take any number of parameters, whereas uh, ES6 arrow functions, unless there's a feature I'm just unaware of, then please tell me, uh, you're just wrapping the function and it's a lot more like a closure. <laughs>